Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for finding us again. Um, it's another, I was going to say rambling conversation, wide-ranging conversation um, uh, today. Uh, I am joined by the famous artist Birdie Rose. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, Birdie, do you want to give us a, a little intro to you and kind of what brings you to talking to me? <laughs> All right, then. Um, I am the famous artist Birdie Rose. I identify as an artist and I identify as famous and uh, you can find my stuff online. Um, I don't like, I do post a lot of art stuff, but I don't know what, well, I do know why it's controversial, but I didn't initially, like I didn't think I'm going to draw pictures of these women that I think are brilliant and speaking out and people are going to hate me for it. I didn't think that. I thought, People might not like it, but we're all grown ups and it will be all right. Yeah. So there, um, we were just chatting before we hit record and I'm saying that the, the kind of broad theme of the conversation I'm having are kind of things gay men need to know or things gay men may not have thought about in the whole gender identity ideology sphere of things going on. So I guess part of our conversation is really going to be a perspective that gay men won't have heard or won't have thought. Like you were just saying then, you weren't expecting it necessarily to to be controversial that kind of stuff so I think that might be part of the interesting angle thinking about peaking more people particularly more men and more gay men so um do you want to give us a like a the kind of your your route to to obviously now you have like the the website and you have quite a lot of different merch as it were um with lots of different cool messages and I I've, I've ordered two of the uh mail to the bone shirt uh, yeah i love them today so um they're on the way but yeah do you want to give a quick uh overview of kind of the what what you were doing before all this and then kind of where you've got to now okay yeah i was already identifying as a famous artist before this yeah. and um i was doing artwork i did a lot of paintings painting's really my thing uh, and then I've moved into the digital world with my art, but I still paint as well and I still draw and all that stuff. So I wasn't really controversial with it at all because I've got my own little world with my paintings and I enjoy that. And occasionally I dipped my toes into having an opinion with my art, mm -hmm. but I strictly stayed away from being a political artist and I still don't consider myself to be a political artist. I don't think that what I'm doing is overly political, if that makes sense. I know other people consider just the question of what is a woman is political now, so that is controversial, but it's political without my consent. If that makes yeah. sense. Like, but my route to this, so I'd say, um, so, pe so people that don't know me, the, the way I got onto this topic was actually a bit of a personal one. So I got diagnosed with PCOS, which is a, an ovary disorder. And um, I wrote about it online and I, I addressed it to women and girls. And I said, hey, women and girls, this is these are the things you need to look out for. These are the things you are you ask your GP about and this is how to get checked for PCOS and if you do get a diagnosis these are some resources and a man that I vaguely knew I sort of knew him from festivals um that my partner does McDo's plays festivals and stuff he's a musician and this guy came into my comments section on Facebook and he was like why have you left out trans women and I said well you have to be a woman to have an ovary disorder yeah. and he got really irate he was like well I don't like the tone you're taking I don't like the fact that you're saying you have to be female that's really offensive and then he started to interrogate me on whether or not I believe that his hypothetical friends that I've never met are actually women because they identify as women and I told him that i don't know his friends and I don't owe it to anyone to say whether I believe in that or not yeah. and this was like before I knew anything was going on I was like what the fuck is this man on he's like a nutter and then um he said to me something like you're worse than the white supremacists in South Africa um what you're doing is no different to what the Nazis done and it's you know and he just went off on one white supremacist racist, turf, bigger, 
transfer all of it it was like he didn't he couldn't decide which one to call me so he called me all of them yeah. and hope for the best yeah. and um from then on i went something stinks about this because i already knew there was some shit going on with the non-binary thing and i didn't really care i didn't care about it i kind of thought it was cool that people were just i thought it was like androgyny mm-hmm. rebooted you know, like when you remake a film, I thought it was like yeah. that. Um, this is this is a new generation of androgyny. Let's go for it. But then I started hearing about this whole thing that men can give birth to, men can have periods, men can have polycystic ovaries, um, kids can go on hormones and shit like that. And I was like, there's something wrong here. And I don't know why it feels so uncomfortable. It felt way more uncomfortable before I knew why it was uncomfortable, if that makes sense. So you yeah. just get a sense that there's certain things you're not allowed to say and certain things you shouldn't be saying. Like I I just tested it out. I used to test it for a laugh. So I went on Facebook and I wrote, women don't have penises. And I just waited. And then within 10 minutes, it was just people I've known for a long time just calling me a disgusting piece of shit and telling me how out of order I am and I've like increasingly become aggressive and hostile. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I'm just testing the waters here to see what people say to this because yeah. I didn't realise it was it was going to be that crazy. Yeah. I was say, were you, were, you were surprised by both the level and the extremity of the... Zero to 100. Um, yeah. Because I knew the trans thing was going on because I had friends that were identifying as transgender and I didn't give a shit. I was kind of like, whatever, if you want to be called a boy, you can be called a boy. Now I feel differently about it. I feel like there are principles I have to stand by now to protect my rights. And I'm not going to um, pander. I was going to say I'm not going to tolerate, but I am a tolerant person, but I'm not going to pander to things that affect me. And when it comes to people telling me I what I am and I'm not allowed to say or what I am and I'm not allowed to believe in, I'm going to put up with that shit. Yeah. I think I don't, I think this is thinking about the peaking more people or more people coming to this, having not, they may know there's something being talked about. They may have seen JK Rowling's been tweeted about and stuff like that, but they don't, they don't know the detail. I think there's a, I was gonna say there's a threshold. There's probably a couple of thresholds that people kind of need to get over where they kind of, before they kind of get full on into it and kind of, you know, gold star turf, know everything. Uh, yeah, just, I uh, think understanding the, the 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 level of it must it must it must look to people who see that kind of response that you're describing that you've got that must seem odd to people. People can't see that and think that's normal. I don't know because. There are people that were, after the women don't have penises status, I think that was in 2018, there are people that came up to me at gigs laughing about it, saying, that's so funny, I can't believe the reaction you got, these people are mental. Those yeah. people are now going after me. Yeah. Those same people that laughed at it in 2018 are now slagging me off and saying how horrible it is that I don't believe women have penises, you know. Yeah. So they the I think a lot of people, what's happened is um, they've seen which they, no, they haven't seen which way the wind's blowing because it, uh-huh. they don't know which way the wind's going to blow. But I think they've placed a bet on who they think is going to win and they think the bullies are going to win. Yeah. I was going to say, what do you think is driving them to to have changed that opinion or, or to move to there? And it's that perception of they're going along with what they think is the kind of, Kind of yeah, they ain't gonna they ain't gonna be on our side and get their heads kicked in, are they? They're gonna go on the bully side and chuck stones at us from cross the road or something. I don't know, metaphorically. And I think it'll be it'll be interesting. I know this has been a, a discussion on turf Twitter about the and I've talked to I think I've probably mentioned it in, in some of these chats with some people as well. The whole what happens when things do tip and more people, the majority are happy to to say the truth and when things like the cast report comes out and whatever you know down the line that the people who are gonna who have been very in the ideology side of things are they going to be saying you know the same as what we're saying now and they're going to be acknowledging reality and how do we like do we let just let them you know i let no one get away with this (laughs) no way 
No way am I letting anyone get away with it. Here's the thing. I've been listening to, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and stuff, and I got really into this series about the Salem witch trials. Mm -hmm. And the bit that I'm on now is that bit where the tide turned and a lot of women and and there were some men as well, a lot of women and children mostly were released from prison, just instantly pardoned. And what happened is... When the tide actually turned, there was whispers beforehand, just whispers, whispers, whispers. And then one day it just went, poof, and suddenly you couldn't get hanged for being a witch anymore. Just, yeah. poof, just like that. And um, what happened with the people involved, surprising, this surprised me, it shouldn't have surprised me, um, is there was a lot of people that covered the tracks of this even happening, like tried to cover it up, tried to make out the this didn't even happen. And then there were a lot of people that claimed that they were against it all along. Yeah. So I think they, that's exactly what's going to happen with this because we've got the build up and we've got the push and the push and push because of social media. So we've got like women on the internet talking about it, men and lesbian women and gay men and people just talking about it, talking about it. And then you've got Kira Bell in court, you've got Alison Bailey in court, you've got Maya Forstar in court, these court cases, then you've got celebrities, JK Rowling, Ricky Gervais, Dave Chappelle, push, push, push. And then one day it's just going to go, just really quietly going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to turn, <laughs> it's going to be, it's not going to be quick getting there, but I think you're right. The, the, the flip is going to be seem like oh it's always been that it's very 1984 like we've always been at war with the other side um and i think it's the the thing i've chatted to some people about is that that difference between the people who've kind of stood by and said nothing or done nothing and not really engaged with it at all even if they've known and seen what's going on it's tactical or, yeah or they've been they've been allies or they've kind of seem to be supported Stonewall because they used to support Stonewall before everything changed and whatever. I think there's that group of people who are what some people describe as like almost the, the group to kind of reach out to in a, there is a way back for you to reality here. You're not extreme ideologists. You've been going along with it and you've hedged your bet may, maybe, or you just stayed out of it. But then there's the people who've been perpetuating it and like you say, covering tracks and that kind of thing. I think that's- Some the, of them are going to double down. Yeah. There was like, um, I've, so I listened to the one about the witch trials. There were judges that doubled down to their dying day that mm -hmm. they did the right thing. And it, the same happened with the satanic panic. There were people that sent people to prison without evidence for being in these um, cult, sex cults yeah. that wasn't even true. And they, to their dying day, said that they did the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, um, part of what people who aren't as involved in this and i'm thinking about it from a, the gay men's perspective or the way to frame it for for gay men particularly but any men any man could understand it when you're talking about males who identify as women particularly they've gone through a surgery route and we're talking about the kids who've and teenagers who've gone through this mostly obviously um it's very um like i always always point people to the susie green ted talk it's like, this is someone who took their son to Thailand to be castrated. They've got to, they can't, they can't come back from that and say, oh, I was wrong. They've got to justify what they've done. Oh my God, do yeah. And, die. and I think I, I commented this week when people were talking about the LGBT Alliance getting the funding to look at how they set up the helpline. And, you know, it's the, how, how much of the, um, venom against that is from people who wish that kind of support had been there so they didn't go down the road they may have gone down and now have regrets i think yeah you're right there's definitely going to be a contingent of people who either have got to justify things they've done to themselves or to their kids and people who have built their professional career on having this position and they've, they've yeah right exactly down. that because i thought about that as an artist right as an artist i gained pretty good traction and sold art basically off the back of being do's and do's is missus that does cool painting mm -hmm. and now I'm in my own right I'm doing art doing all this stuff mm -hmm. and you know when this is over I'm still going to be an artist I haven't pinned my whole artist identity on this but there are people that have there are artists that have pinned their whole artist identity on being a man talking about what it's like to be a woman yeah. 
Yeah. And that's going to, when that goes down the pan, what's he going to do? And there were loads of kids doing it as well. Young people, young artists coming up, painting pictures of themselves with top surgery and stuff like that and the flag behind them. How are they going to feel about that in 10 years time when it's not the cool thing anymore? Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Thinking about that actually with the amount of um, kind of illustration that kind of surrounds the, um, the gender ideology, gender identity ideology stuff um you know i've joked about well not joked about but kind of said about the if you've got an anime avatar <laughs> probably you've got pronouns then you're definitely getting blocked on twitter like 100 percent. but i think there's there's an interesting that idea of or i'm interested in your perspective as an artist in that that connection between the talk and the ideology is about identifying as whatever you want. And if you're illustrating, art can be whatever you want. So if you're representing yourself in a way that you can present, because you're drawing it, oh, it can be anything you oh want. Oh my God, like that man that draws himself as like an eight-year-old little girl talking to kids about sex stuff. Mm. I mean, I don't know if he talks about sex stuff, but you, you know who I'm talking about. I can't remember his name. Yeah, that's weird. Because yeah. some of these guys, like these met these weirdos in it, are drawing pictures of themselves as little girls and like just living out their fantasies. There's like this one meme of it. It's like a man on the floor and he's come out of his body as a woman. Mm. And um, on it is like, nobody understands what it's like to be me and all this shit on it. And uh, that stuff's okay if it's in comic books and it's fantasy and you know that this is just like a pure sci-fi yeah. weirdo shit whatever you want to read in a comic book there's the comic book for nearly everything isn't there but um not okay if you're gonna paint your whole or literally paint your whole identity around that and say yeah. that this is who i am this picture yeah. is who i am that's weird yeah and do you think there's a um <laughs> so i'm going to ask you questions to speak on behalf of all artists but obviously recognizing not <laughs> um but that 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 in the kind of I mean, I don't know kind of how, what kind of arty circles you, you move in, but we'll know other arty people or. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, up until this, this um, whole thing of getting cancelled got yeah. me, uh, propel, propelled me into the face of other artists that are being cancelled. So this is the most in arty circles I've ever been. I've mainly been in the music circles because of my yeah. partner. But um, as an artist, I've always kind of been a bit of a loner. And I think that's a uh, catch 22 as an artist because a lot of artists are loners. Yeah. And so we don't really want to hang out with other artists and be like, hey, let's talk about art. It's not really something I do too much of, but I do yeah. like talking about art. I think yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I'm naturally a bit of a loner with it and I'm a yeah. bit of a loner with my work as well. So I don't yeah. feel too, um, I'm not too downtrodden about the fact that not many people like what I do. Yeah. I'm sure, I mean, there are a lot of people <laughs> who like what you do, but I think the... But, uh, Yes, there are a lot of people that like what I do now, but yeah. like when I got cancelled and stuff, I wasn't I wasn't um, heartbroken that people don't like my new art. I yeah. was kind of like, well, you know what? People didn't like my art for about ten years before they knew who I was, anyway. So yeah, um, going back a second to the thing you said before about that that idea of the an artist being a loner, and I guess that's somewhat of a stereotype but that is going to be there and i know a lot of people have talked it's a about stereotype that. for a reason yeah because it's true yeah but like people have talked about during pandemic and lockdowns and stuff and that's how, how that's perpetuated the kind of kids that are seeking for an identity and and they're slightly detached from reality because their day-to-day -day normality is is on hold and they are at home on their own without that kind of connection and so i guess that it lends itself to another thing that kind of pushes them towards the, well, I'm just going to, I can kind of express myself creatively with art. And actually that's a thing that is a fan. That's now my fantasy. And it's that, it's that crossing that line between, like you say, if it's, if you're doing this, knowing it's fantasy, because it's a comic book or it's sci-fi or whatever, but when you're, when they're doing it in a, this is who I really wish I was because of what I'm being led to believe, it kind of becomes something else. It's serious. This is serious stuff because we're on the internet a lot and we're all plugged in, yeah? yeah? And these young people are plugged in and they're living out their reality in the cyber world. And that's not reality, but they're not... Um, I don't know. I don't speak to loads of young people. I don't know loads of young people. I've got a 21-year-old nephew, but he just goes like this to me. 
all right? Yeah. Like that. That's it. That's the most I get out of him. But um, yeah, young people nowadays, I think they're a lot of them are clinging onto the internet as their reality, and we're about to get the metaverse, and that's that's going to be a big problem because then people are going to live their whole lives out in the metaverse and they're not going to live in the real world and they can be anybody and anything they want. They could be like a caterpillar if they want in the metaverse. And how are we going to regulate that? Yeah. I think it's how, how we, it's almost an extension of the wear whatever you want, call yourself whatever you want thing. It's like the, in a fantasy realm, you can be whatever you want because it's not real. I think that it's the, when you say regulating that, I think it's the how do we put in the protections for people who flip, who who kind of almost slip over that line into a that becomes their reality, and they kind of the the kind of mental health crisis that we're going to face with a load of people who are detached from reality and having having the kind of messages reinforced through you know health trusts and other institutions that have been have gone along with trying to be inclusive and trying to be kind but are now perpetuating language that's just not reality it's- yeah and it is it is strange i was going to ask you actually just now what's the mental health if we call it a crisis what's the mental health crisis like among gay men so i think there's always been um there's always been, or mental health has always been a thing that has been talked about in terms of gay men and gay men's health. I think men's health generally, there's all the statistics about, you know, the highest rate of suicide is, is yep. um, young men. Um, you know, I think it's second only to um, road traffic accidents or that kind of for a particular age group and that kind of thing. So I think that the mental health of, of or well, the mental health has been a, a big aspect of talking about gay men's health. I think there's also... Um, po- probably less so now, but thinking back to when I was a, a teenager in that kind of era, as we've kind of shifted and there's been more exceptions, there was still a that you know the personal anxiety of the coming out, the um, you know, gay young gay men or gay teenage boys that are kind of will have anorexia and those sorts of um, uh, issues going on for them. I think there's there's definitely been a that kind of background for 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 gay men in terms of mental health um i think that what worries me now is those sorts of issues in the same way we've seen with the rapid onset gender um dysphoria for teenage girls it's actually the the next increase is boys generally but i think that it's that any of those other issues that you may have had either that are causing that or will come from if you're if you are trying to come to terms with understanding your sexuality before you even know what that is and the, the anxiety that comes with that and any other mental health issues that's all being lost because it's all being put down to oh you just you're in the wrong body that's that's your answer so yeah i think there's there's a yeah gay gay men's health generally well the bigger thing for obviously gay men's health more generally is been hiv aids for a long time uh, and sexual health stuff um and mental health has kind of been a big part too but yeah that that feels like that's being overshadowed and that's another another area that's being lost in the way that stonewall was doing good work that's been lost other charities and organizations that are doing or had been doing good work have been lost to prioritizing the gender ideology stuff yeah that's a shame really that the gender ideology is getting prioritized in all areas of society at the moment I would say not well not all but most Mm. it seems to be um this is the new thing and this is the the only thing it's not just a new thing it's the only thing that we can think about and that we can do yeah he's all right um I was gonna ask you as we came on to health um and definitely thinking about a thing that most gay men won't have an understanding of um if you want to just if you could not I was like, talk about uh, your PCOS, but more that your experience of that going through something that is very clearly a, a woman's health issue. So one of my sisters has endometriosis. So I have an idea of some of the kind very of similar stuff, um, but a lot of gay men, obviously that won't be an area area. They have any expertise or knowledge in or men in men in general, but just briefly on, on what that is, but then the anything you've experienced in terms of your interaction with, with health service providers that has either already seen the impact of 
where gender identity ideology crept into those service providers or how different it would be if you had to go through stuff like that again for the first time yeah. knowing how things are now well i it took me a long time to get my pcos diagnosis because the doctors didn't quite believe me or they didn't really care and i was like my doctor was registered where I grew up and it's quite a poor area. So the, I think the postcode lottery thing is real um, when it comes to medical services and my doctors didn't give a shit. And every time I asked them for tests to find out if I have PCOS, they told me that I was just, um, I was probably pregnant. I just need to do a pregnancy test like if I'd put on weight they said it's because I was pregnant if I had lost weight they said it's because oh you're just you know you're just anxious um if I was suffering a lot of pain which I have done since I was 11 I started my period when I was 11 very young and oh, it was been very painful all my life and I, I'm legitimately like this is a weird thing to talk to a man about but legitimately have still at 35 years old have nightmares about getting my period it's mm. that bad and maybe your sister might relate to that with the endometriosis the, yeah. the pain's incredible and I've had that for so I'm 34 now I started when I was 11 what's that 24 years I've had enough mm. I've had enough of it and um, the way the medical services treat it is like it's a bit of guesswork. Oh, we'll just um, we'll just chuck some marbles over there and see what happens. That's what that's how they're treating it. Like I had to do a lot of my own research. Thank goodness for the internet. Do a lot of my own research and then I print it off and I take it to the doctor. And I'm quite pushy now as well because yeah. I live in a bit of a nicer area and the doctors actually listen to me and don't just shout at me and tell me to stop wasting their time. So that's quite good. Like I had that with the receptionist at the old doctors I used to go to, the shitty one. Receptionist used to shout at me on the phone, mm. tell me I don't need another appointment. I don't need to keep talking about this. I'm like, this ain't even your business. You're a receptionist. So I think like a lot of the way um, people are being treated medically is to do with the services where they live and not enough money being put into it. And and the actual facilities like the the amount of doctors and everything being stretched and seeing too many patients in a day I don't know how much gender ideology has come into it where I live because the doctors never once asked me for my pronouns or anything but I guarantee you I will kick up a shit stink if they do I ain't having it yeah like you know what I am you don't need my pronouns don't ask me if I'm a unicorn or a caterpillar or a dinosaur I'm a woman um but in terms of the PCOS, it has been really hit and miss. And I have had to do a lot of my own research and then relay it to the doctors. I get patronized a lot as well. Like I had this gynecology appointment once and then it was a guy and I didn't really want him to examine me anyway because I was like, you're a bloke. I prefer a, whim a woman, even though there are arguments that some women are not as good at the blokes at, at their job. Um, I still feel more comfortable with a woman. Okay. It's always going to be hit and miss whether they're good at doing the exam anyway. And um, this guy, he didn't even examine me. He just printed off a leaflet about what PCOS is and gave it to me. This was like a few years after my diagnosis. I already knew what it was. I didn't need to be patronised in this way. So it is patronising. Um, I don't know how much of it. Again, like I used to think it patronising because um, – a the patriarchy and everyone hates women and this is just another way of oppressing women and now I'm wondering if it is to do with postcode lottery and class and how much money you've got and where you live rather than that to be honest yeah, I think those are those definitely are. having worked uh in kind of some not health bodies but with health with doctors in professional capacities uh and seeing some of those sorts of issues from a lobbying perspective particularly um yeah those are definitely issues that that, you know the NHS is stretched and um those sorts those sorts of issues postcode lottery I think from from my not my experience the experience I have of having heard other women I know and their experience of uh medical services and having seen you know people talk about it online I think there's definitely a there's a difference I don't think it's the patriarchy trying because they anyone hates women or trying to prevent women i think it's just it's women's health is seen as subconsciously secondary that yeah. it's a 
you know, all the, I used to do, um, back in the day when I was out of work, I did medical trials for a couple of years on and off. Um, and they did have women on there, but the criteria for being on there was so much stricter because, uh, depending on where, how old you are, whether you're on the pill, what are the conditions you may have as a woman, those can all throw out the standardized testing they do for testing medications and stuff like that. So it's mostly men that end up doing that. So most of the the outcomes are looking at a male benchmark. Uh, and I've said this to, to someone else on one of the chats as well about the you know, um, vehicle testing, crash test dummies are of, and they, they may have changed now, but they've always been of an average male height and weight and those sorts of things. So the world is first built for men with women seen as secondary, not yeah. trying to oppress women or anything. That's kind of how things have gone. I think particularly in the health service, there's definitely a, and again, um, with women I know, have had th- this feedback of a, oh, it's just period pain, or yeah. there's not a, there's not an understanding of the issues because there's not enough recognition that it is actually an issue. And I think that's what worries me as I'm not as someone who's going to have to face that directly. But having seen that, that if the NHS is confused about what a woman is and they're having to use language that isn't really clear and direct about who they're talking to and what they're talking about on an area of health they aren't that great at acknowledging and dealing with anyway, that is not going to end up have, providing a better... We're fucked. For women. Yeah. We're yeah. fucked. <laughs> Might as well just say you identify as a man then you get treated seriously. Or yeah. say you're non-binary. I've actually had thoughts like that because, like, obviously I have very painful periods and I sort of made a joke, but I kind of meant it, said to my fella that um, if the doctor refuses to give me a hysterectomy, I'll tell him I'm non-binary. Yeah. And then I thought, how sick is that 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 even went through my head, that I even had to think like that because I know yeah. that I'm 35. Okay, so I'm over 31, so could be eligible for something like that but I haven't had a kid and they're always pushing for you to have a kid and it's like well I've got a condition that would make that difficult and I was born with health conditions as well that could make that difficult and I'm pretty sure at this point I don't really want kids I like spending my days going to the gym and drawing pictures I'm not like I like looking after nieces and nephews but I love giving, giving them, them back, back. to mum and yeah. dad yeah <laughs> give them back get them out of here don't want them anymore they've done my head in but yeah. you know I just I'm pretty sure I know what I want at this age and not a lot of room for regret and it does annoy me that you can get like 18 19 year olds can get a hysterectomy mm-hmm. because they're non-binary or trans and uh, yeah. yeah that that boils my piss yeah and it's another area that I think people who aren't engaged in the debate yet don't realize that that happens and that there are permanent uh, implications for medical decisions that teenagers are making because of an identity yeah. thing it, which in and of itself is is concerning to say the least but then when you put that against actual provision of those sorts of medical services aren't being provided for women and I, there's a shortage of HRT because... Yeah, I was thinking about that just the, now. <laughs> the hormones that aren't replacement hormones, they are hormones that are being given to people of the wrong, of the opposite sex that they're not intended for. And it's... And they take, the men take three times the amount, don't they? Three or four times the amount of HRT. I do have friends that have endometriosis and that have gone through menopause and they have been affected by the HRT shortage. And I've had to bite my tongue because I don't quite... You know, not everybody in my life is totally on board with mouthing off about this like I am. But bit my tongue and I politely just sort of said, you know, it is unfair. It is definitely unfair that women are missing out on this treatment because their lives are actually made miserable by not being able to access HRT. And then there's men saying that they'll kill themselves if they don't get it. That ain't the same thing, dude. Like that is not the same thing as actually being in pain. Yeah. And I don't think, I mean, there's, there's, there's various, um, what's the word? Not like old tales about, or like cultural kind of awareness of a men's and women's threshold for pain kind of being, being different, but like the level of pain. And I say this again, as 
the big brother to to someone who has endometriosis that's a i'm doubled over in pain and i can't get out of bed like that's a that has that has physically debilitated me for a couple of days and then triggers migraines and then like there's a knock-on effect of it as well so i don't i don't think men realize the level of pain and because it's not a it's not talked about and i don't think like in the workplace most women i would assume don't want to talk about that openly in the office with everyone and a bunch of members no way so it's kind of a and bosses aren't always great at, at, at dealing with it so it's just a and sometimes it's women through. yeah sometimes women have got women like before I got diagnosed with PCOS, I had a lot of women have a go at me saying I'm being dramatic. It's just period pains. Get over it. Every, we all have to do it. We all have to come into work with our period pain. And yep. I was like, no, you don't understand. This is different. Like, it's just, just, I think it's not, you know, obviously men clearly don't understand because it doesn't happen to men unless they've got a sister or a relative or a partner who they see go through it all the time, then they can sort of go, they can vouch for us if that makes sense. Yeah. But women that don't go through it, they're very callous about it. Like, especially younger women, younger women don't believe you at all. They're just like, Oh, fuck that. You're being dramatic. You're old. Yeah. I wonder how, yeah, it just makes me think in terms of that in the, the wider gender identity ideology debate and what we're talking about before with the people who are going along with it and that kind of difference between men and women who are going along with it and why i think that's and gay men what's up with gay men going along with it what are they doing what are they thinking well i think there's a i think there's a the, the gay men are almost like a step removed from straight men when it comes to interactions and reliance on women so, well, yeah, there's a, I think there's a difference in terms of a, how much does this affect me? So as a woman, it should be, it should be, although not all women for whatever reason are getting it or saying they're getting it. There is a more direct impact on women of the gender identity ideology stuff as adults. I think as kids, there's obviously differences depending on uh, what, you know, uh, what's going on with gender clinics for kids. But the, the broader, if a man can just say he's a woman, a woman can just say she's a man that's going to the the impact of that is going to impact women more because of the physical threat the physical advantage in sport the those yeah prisons all that kind of stuff there is an impact on men but it's not anywhere near that that thing it's coming though it's coming because i think what happened is um so lesbian women have been they've been shouting about this Mm -hmm. for a long time some lesbian women i mean there's still a lot of them that ain't on board but there are lesbian women that have been shouting about this probably for more than a decade. A lot of them around about a decade, they saw this coming. They saw their spaces being taken up by men who say that they're lesbian women. They got creeped on and they shouted about it and told everyone. And I think initially nobody believed them. Mm. And now people are starting to hear it. And I think what's happened is that's happened with women for so long. And the gay men, this is my assumption, you can tell me if I'm wrong, didn't pay attention because they didn't think it had happened to them. And now it's starting to happen to them because the culture has changed and you have these young women now saying that they're men. They're not just saying they're men, they're saying they're gay men and they're now saying, you've got to sleep with me. You've got to sleep with me or you're discriminating against me. And these women are not dainty little women from the 50s. These young women are brutal and they're going to, and they're spoiled brats for the most part as well. And they're going to come after you. Yep. And I don't think gay men saw that coming, women coming after them yes. for bigotry, for not sleeping with them. I don't think gay men thought that was going to be a thing. Yeah, I think it's that they, speaking on behalf of gay men, I think that it's the <laughs> um, an element of not, it's not just not thinking it would happen. It's not even thinking about the fact that it could happen. Like that didn't even cross I think gay men thought minds. that they could... I think gay men thought that if a girl asks them to sleep with them, even if she's got a beard, they'd just go, no, thank you, and it'd be fine. Yeah. They didn't realise that girl wasn't going to take no for an answer. Yeah. And I don't I mean, think our culture is ready for young women who don't take no for an answer. I don't think we've got that into our heads that there are women that are... I mean, it's a good thing that we're not um, sticking rigidly to sect stereotypes, mm-hmm. but young women nowadays are 
behaving more entitled and they're behaving more entitled towards gay men spaces. And I don't think, I think gay men need to wake up a little bit. So this is me, this is my message. You need to wake up a little bit and realise that this could come to you and you'll be in a very awkward situation when you're accused of bigotry for not sleeping with a young woman who has a fantastic beard. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's the, again, it, there's not, there's not the same physical risk on average looking at average you know body types and sizes that doesn't mean there's not any physical risk depending on how uh captured by the cult she is and what she's prepared to do like we've seen the escalation of violence from the TRAs yeah. um like I've I've had it in a very small way at the protest I was arrested at Manchester had it escalated even further and that's not going to that's not going to stop. They're going to get worse. And I don't think because of that, it doesn't affect men in the same way. They've either not thought about it at all. And that, that gay men are a further step removed from women are on average than straight men. It's just not, it's only just now starting to kind of um, become apparent to gay men that they, there will be effects on them. And now, particularly if they're, they've been in that, you know, whatever the, the workplace LGBT network is or their friends who volunteer with whichever charities, they are now starting to realise it, but they are surrounded by the ideology. How awful is that as well, though? Because you're now surrounded by these people that you've just realised could hurt you if you come out and say the wrong thing. That's not a good situation to be in as well. I yeah. thought that about... Um, I've got some lesbian friends and some of them I've known since we were teenagers... They've unfriended me or unfollowed me over this. And these these people I know in real life, and I was thinking about it earlier today because I was thinking about this interview, and I was thinking, did they do that? Be not because they hate what I'm saying, not because they don't realise that men are not women, because obviously they do, otherwise they're not lesbians, right? But because they feel uncomfortable because of the environment they're in and the pressure to not be caught out. Yeah, I think there's definitely a an awareness of um, cancel culture, although we know it's mostly an attempt to cancel and the broader stuff around what that is in terms of shutting people out or shutting people down or cutting people out of your life or being cut out of people's lives. Like I've talked about my closest friend completely. Uh, I'm dead to him now, pretty much. He's not spoken to me in months. Um, months, a year, maybe. Um, it's just because he's fully on board with the the stonewall message and i think i think i think in that in that example that's possibly a has gone far enough to have said it enough to almost believe it as opposed to going along with it because they don't want to be seen to say the wrong thing i think most people particularly the the allies and particularly the um kind of straight people who are trying to be allies to to lgb because that's what they've always seen as being a positive um do question it like um talking with lucy masood in a previous video about like her gay male friends who are all in private between themselves are saying it's all gone too far now this is whatever but can't can't say that yeah loud yeah that, that's interesting isn't it because i've done some art and i've made some meme sort of speaking up for gay men and and a lot of memes and stuff I've made for lesbian. And um, I've had a few people say, thanks for sticking up for lesbians and all the this. And I thought to myself, I can shout about gay, lesbian, bisexual rights mm -hmm. all day long because I won't get my head kicked in for saying it because I'm not in those circles. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah there must be there must be a lot of, like you say, quietly saying it to each other once they've figured out that they can say it to each other behind closed doors and not saying it, like you're not going to say it in a club or anything. Yeah. And that's the, although I've just had my, I've had the uh, LGB and then the dotted line and the scissors TQ. I nice. Heard. So uh, I'm just picking out what am I wearing to pride in London? <laughs> um, do, you, do you get scared about things like that though? Do you worry that you're going to get sort of like shouted at or attacked and things like that? Um, I'm not, not worried particularly. Like, obviously I went to the Downing Street thing and got arrested and was, um, kind of, try, you know, the TRA lot tried to drag me away and we're having, yeah, I saw that video. Wherever. So that's, um, 
that was more there were other people I thought were going to be there and then other people arrived later and then that was just uh avoiding being too organized we weren't accused of organizing a protest without permission whatever so that was a failure on my part in essentially going on my own so I have talked to other people about is there something we want to do in terms of going to pride or those sorts of events I think I'm not I'm not worried in terms of being arrested because that's anyway, already happened that. it's not, <laughs> yeah as I said to a couple of people, it's very different if you're a woman. It's very different depending on what station you end up at, but it's not something to be afraid of broadly. Um, and I'm not saying anything that, uh, you know, it's, I'm not being arrested for what I'm saying because I have a protected right to hold those beliefs. And I'm just talking about reality. Um, I know that if I'm arrested or if there's physical intimidation, it's because they're in trying to intimidate us to not speak. The truth about reality and I'm not I'm just not for that sorry no I'm um, not for that either and I think it's not a great look coming from the people that are always shouting about how wrong homophobia is and right. you know one of the things I get accused of a lot by people that knew me that now hate me they like to tell each other that I'm doing the same as what the homophobes did in the 80s yeah. which is you know repeated by everybody now but they say that and it is their people or people that are on their allies that are going to pride marches and attacking gay men and lesbian women. Yep. So who's doing what the homophobes did in the 80s? Because I ain't at no marches shouting at gay men and lesbian women and yep. trying to attack you or whatever it is. I ain't doing that. I can't be bothered with all that. And even like even if I believed in that, I don't think I'd bother because I'm lazy. Yeah. So... <laughs> Like, like what I mean by that is that they've gone out of their way to leave their house yep. to shout at gay men, lesbian women, bisexual people, whatever. And they think that they're not homophobes. Yeah. I think the, I think the, the kind of more core actually in the cult group, maybe either don't know or don't care that the ideology is homophobic just in and of itself is homophobic well it ain't about truth is it it's about like when they when they call you a homophobe it's the same as when they call you a racist or a nazi yeah. it ain't true they're just saying it like it's like when a kid says shit yeah. well it's like you're swearing at somebody that's what it is they're venting yeah. at you they're just chucking yeah. all the words at you yeah, well, it's trying the, to hurt you. Try this word that didn't shut you up. Let's try this one instead. That didn't. Let's try the next one. It's like transphobe has lost all meaning. Yeah, I they've gone the, for the one. The ones going after me have gone for um, alt right. Yeah, alt right, and um, oh, radicalized by the far right on the internet. That's what they're going for now. Not that I recognise the difference between the sexes. It's I've been radicalised. Yeah. And the other one is that I've gone mental and had a breakdown. I've, I've had a mental breakdown. That's why I'm doing this. All the best artists do, right? <laughs> well, I haven't chopped my ear off yet, so. Um, but, yeah, the, the the wider group of kind of allies are not necessarily believing it group. I think they, the, when you said about the people referring to the, oh, this is what people did to, to gay people in the past. I think they don't realise that that is the homophobia of the shorthand almost of I'm just going to default to, well, trans is the same as gay. So if it's happened, it's like you don't talk about this for any kind of racial issues. You don't talk about it like that for any they kind do of now. issues about disability. Or you don't, you know, there's not <laughs> the whole, um, it, it fascinates me with the- They do a little bit because they do the black women are women, so why aren't men women? Yeah, yeah. But like black like, black women are apparently different to real women. Yeah. So and so are men. The um, what was it? The conversion therapy debate thing this week about um, I can't remember which which MP said it when I was listening in, but the that we should have the the conversion therapy ban to cover all conversion therapy, and they don't mean all conversion therapy. They're talking about they're talking about two types of conversion therapy, one of which isn't really conversion therapy. So why? And this is one of the conversations I was having or trying to have at the demo I went to at Downing Street or next to, I wasn't at part of the demo, about, well, why, why are you calling for a conversion therapy ban that's about gender identity and sexuality and not other things 
Why aren't you asking yeah. for the conversion therapy to include you... religion? I was about to say that. Like, the, what if somebody tries to get you to believe in God? Can you accuse them of conversion therapy because yeah. you're you're an atheist, for example? Or, you know, I've got a friend that's Buddhist. If she does her little Buddha, I don't mean to diminish it, her beautiful Buddha chanting near yeah. me, is she trying to convert me to a Buddha? Because yeah. I don't want to be a Buddha because yeah. I'm lazy and I can't chant every day. Just yeah. about make it to the gym. That's that. It's that <laughs> assumption people have because they haven't bothered to think because the T's just been added on and then the Q and then the plus. They just see it all as this one thing. And most people, and I, I think that is inherently homophobic in a, it's all just one. Of course it is. Well, the T got added on quietly because I can't remember thinking, why is the T there? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I obviously I, I was a little baby in the 80s, so I don't remember all that. I don't remember if it was an LGB before. But I just remember it being LGBT, but I know that that got added on quietly because I didn't think about what T meant until all of this started. Yeah, well, I think it's, I, I vaguely remember LGB stuff before it was LGBT. I was trying to think, so the LGBT, I think it was an LGBT society at my university and was already LGBT, not that there were any T people. Um so it was around then that I was wearing kind of, of, of being that. Obviously, I, I was chair of trustees to the LGBT consortium, and there were still organizations that were members of that that were only LGB or only L or only G or whatever. It wasn't a, you have to be everything. The only one you can be on its own is T. Um, but I think the, the, the early adding of T was the homosexual transsexuals. It was the trans, transsexuals, mostly gay men, but also some lesbian women who were transsexuals and therefore they were L or G based on their sex and then yep. that was kind of See, that that was. kind of makes sense because they were already L or G yeah. or B and I don't know how I don't know how early the the straight spicy straights got in didn't they yeah, yeah. when do you but, reckon that was I I used to think it was 2010 but now I'm thinking maybe it was early 2000s I think it was definitely earlier I think there's definitely, I mean, there's all the stuff around obviously the Denton's document and how how um, deliberate some of it has been as a, and, you know, deliberate and effective in how they've done the quietly, not even campaigning, just the you know, getting into things. Um, and I think there's quite a broad overlap between the, it was about the initial, the original adding of T because it was, a, it was transsexual as we would have talked about it then. And that was mostly gay men and lesbians living as if they were the opposite sex to cope with gender dysphoria. There's a big overlap between that and the slow creep in of T could mean it becoming transgender. Um, that's probably actually, a, it's one I have noted about trying to do like a timeline type video of that kind of progression from a gay man's perspective of a, this is what you've, this is the language you've heard, particularly younger gay men. That's all the language they've heard. But actually, where has that come from? Because it doesn't mean what you think it means. Yeah. I think that's a good idea, actually. You should have, um, uh, you should maybe do a project where younger gay men talk to older gay men who are critical of this and remember what it was before the tea was in. Yeah. Yeah. There should be a project around that. Yeah, I'm writing that down while I mean I can obviously watch this back and write that down, but yeah. Um, and I think um I think it should be the same for lesbians and bisexual as well. Talk to the older ones, talk to the younger yeah. ones. Maybe yeah. LGB Alliance can do some sort of project with that as well. Yeah, I hope that would be a good one. I should uh mention that to them. I think there's there's definitely a an area of interest with the what actually happened. Like I've I've posted on I'm quite turfy on LinkedIn in recent months as well. Um Naughty. And it's great because you get, um, you'll get someone send a follow, uh, like a connection request for LinkedIn and you'll see all their other followers like, oh, it's all the turfs, they're a turf. <laughs> like um, on Twitter. Yeah. He's like, because like, previously on LinkedIn, it's been anyone in this particular industry that I was in at the time, it's that's the group of people I was connected on LinkedIn and then moved to this industry and now it's all that sort of person. And now my most recent connections on LinkedIn are all kind of, uh, gender realists i was gonna say turfs as well i like but, that gender realists but that's a good the, term yes. um i think the but yeah i i posted a thing about it being pride month and the things that you can do or not do 
to actually be helpful. And one of them is all about the understand that the LGB being lumped with the TQ plus it's different things. And if you're just lumping them together, that's just a lazy at best and at worst homophobic. It's yeah, very insidious at worst. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's what I was going to ask you about that you mentioned before. In terms of who you talk to about this and how you 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 talked you said before about when you bite your tongue and when you talk to people. So I'm I'm really keen, uh, both of these videos and the stuff I'm aiming to do more of more generally is the how do we just reach more people? I know lots of people are doing that, mm-hmm. but it's the how how do you judge when to mouth mouth off about stuff and when not to, or who to <laughs> well, or who to take. <laughs> Well, okay, when it comes to the internet, I just do it and see what happens. Mm. When it comes to real life, I um, I like to think I'm fairly good at reading people in real life. Like maybe not so much on the camera because you're not getting the same feelings. Yeah. But I think it's because I'm deaf as well, so I rely on lip, lip reading, a lot yeah. of body language watching, and I get a sense of where that person is. And I'm very, um, I think I, I think personally, I'm very good we're talking about this and I peaked a few friends and I meet them at their level with it basically mm. like if they're talking about well you know what if um somebody just feels like you know in their soul they feel like a man and I go well you know your soul that depends on whether you believe in it or not some people don't believe in a soul so now we're talking about something that's metaphysical that doesn't live in our reality and when we're writing laws around how to protect women and children how are we going to base that are we going to write it on what's in the metaphysical or we're going to write it on what's in reality and if we base it on the belief in souls then there are lots of other ideas and beliefs that we should be basing our laws on and I go down that route with them I maybe don't say it all in one breath but (laughs) say it over a cup of tea or something but when it comes to it in real life I've, I've peaked a few friends I've spoken to a few friends about it but the people that we know that and nearly pretty much all of them have turned on us. Mm-hmm. And the reason I bring this up is because what that means is no one has spoken to me about this personally that has objected to it. Nobody, not one person, has even tried to have a conversation with me about this. And they spend a lot of time shouting online about how unreasonable I am and how yeah. I want to have a conversation. But no one has come to me and said, I don't believe this. Why are you saying this? Nobody's done that. I've had, like I said, a couple of personal friends that, to be honest, it weren't too hard for me to talk to them because they were respectful with me. I was respectful with them. At first, they were like, oh, my God, I totally get where you come from. Um, You know, I obviously support trans rights, but I totally get you and I'm, I'm with you. And then give them two weeks of researching on their own and they're texting me going, that's a fucking man. Why are they calling him a woman in the newspaper? that's it they do it people once you've seen it you can't unsee it and i think people are afraid to talk to people like us because they know that they know that the spell will be broken like graham linehan said it was like a spell and um, there's a lot of people that warn people off of talking to me they don't talk to her about it because she's aggressive and she'll just beat you up that that is a tactic to stop you from being from having the spell broken Yep. by by me <laughs> and all, yep. I don't have to say a lot um to to break the spell for you yeah. um and some people like I had one person years ago before I knew really because you get you when you first realize something's going on you don't get all of your language straight because you're still merged in the language that's evolved yep. around this quietly and so you need to figure out what your thoughts are and articulate yourself quite well. And one of the ways I've done that is ranting at my fella every day about it. And then I got better at it. And then I stopped ranting at him because I know I can do it. And um, so you, you don't have all your thoughts together. And I got interrogated once in a pub at a gig um, by somebody that was a friend at the time. And she was insisting that our male friend was born female and we just didn't notice it because we are ignorant. And the the doctors basically flipped a coin and decide what gender everybody is, gender, and that this is the biggest medical scandal and um, I'm going to be embarrassed when it comes out that nobody knows what gender anybody is because the doctors are fucking fucking it all up and being lazy. And... 
I refused to concede that this man is a woman and that he was born female. And she had a lot of very petty arguments. Like at one point in the conversation, she pointed at my belly and she said, you should know better. And I went, what do you mean? And she went, you've got PCOS. And I think she was trying to imply that that's the same as him, that yeah. he's a woman with PCOS and so am I. And I was so fucked off. But I didn't, um, it's not that I didn't have the balls, it's I didn't have the words to stick up for myself in the way that I wanted to. Yeah. And I couldn't just chuck my beer on her and tell her to fuck off because <laughs> we were at a gig and I had to be yeah. professional. So I took the interrogation and got a headache by the end of the night. And that if that was today, it would have gone very differently because I would have shut her down straight away. Yeah. I would have said, you're not talking to me like that and you're not going to intimidate me or try to bully me into going along with whatever mad shit you believe in. Yeah. yeah. End of. I think you're right about the, the people avoiding even having the conversation because they know if they actually have to explain their thinking not even justify themselves just walk through their thinking they, and some of these some of these idiots think they can just bully you into it yeah. so i just in a really long way told you that i didn't have the words and i couldn't articulate it myself but i've also just said to you that if it was today i would have just simply said you're not going to bully me into this mm -hmm. you don't need all the words yeah. You just need to stick up for yourself and your boundaries and say, no, I yeah. don't believe in this. You can believe whatever you like. Um, I don't have any of my, and I've got a lot of different religion friends. I've got Muslim friends, Buddhist friends, Christian friends, Jewish friends. I don't have any of them trying to intimidate me to mm -hmm. worship their God or yeah. to even believe any of their ideas. Yeah. None of them, not one of them says to me and says, well, in my book, it says this. Well, actually, they do tell me what's in their book, but they don't do it in a way of you need to believe it. Well. Yeah. They do it in a in a respectful conversation when we're talking about something. Yeah. And if I if I'm receptive to it, you know, because you've got to read each other in those situations. Yeah. But, you know, nobody's telling me I have to believe or I'm I can't be the friend anymore because I'm discriminating against them by not believing in their shit. Yeah. And I think a lot of people on our end that are quiet about it are scared of not being able to counteract the points that are brought up, like when they say things like, um, you just need to get with the times. That was one of the things that was said to me. I didn't know what to say to that. I yeah. should have said, fuck off. Yeah. But I felt like I had to justify, that, like all the justification needed to come from me, but it doesn't. They're the ones with the mad, shitty ideas. They need to justify it. Yeah. I think you're right about the that you said about the it's finding the language to st or to meet them where they're at almost or start the starting point because they are still in that world of that is if that's if you're about. speaking respectfully with someone that yeah. is if it's somebody who values you that you value and they're showing you that they're willing to listen and you're showing them that you're willing to meet them there that is that's when it goes really well if somebody comes at you with all this, why don't you believe so and so is a woman? Why are you doing this? All this shit. Tell them to fuck off. Yeah, I'm say it's the same as trolls on Twitter. It's not. It's not going anywhere. I block them. So yeah, I block them, and then they go. Um, somebody. So I blocked a few of them once, and it's happened a few times. People sent me a screenshot afterwards and gone. Oh, that person's claiming that um, they ran you off of Twitter. And I'm like, well, let them have it. Let them have their five minutes. I mean, you ran me off. You ran me a random woman off a of Twitter. All right, then, if, if yeah. that's what makes you happy. Yeah. I mean, that that could, that could summarizes the world we're in that has this. It's uh, <laughs> not only do people think that men can be women as detached from reality, it's they think Twitter is reality. <laughs> yes. But do you know what, though? People say that to me. People say, oh, you know, Twitter's not the real world. So. You know, you're worrying too much about what these um, nutters are saying on the internet. But then we're seeing it creep into the real world. Yeah. We've never had the internet before. We've never had social media. We've never had Twitter before. So we've got no reference to look back on to see if this actually does affect our real world. And we're now yeah. seeing that it does. And it's very closely linked to our real world. So that that's another thing. I mean, like, I imagine that would have been the same with books. People would have said, oh, books don't affect the real world. But I guarantee you there are a lot of books out there that spread a lot of mad mental ideas that influenced our society. Yeah, I think the the worrying thing, like you say, 
we, what we've what we've got now that we didn't have before is the speed at which it can be out there and how widespread and how easy it is, which is great on the one hand, but the downside that comes with that is people can obviously say whatever crazy shit they want. I think the distinction um, in terms of like with Twitter is the, is this a random person without a real photo with pronouns in the bio talking a load of shit or is this, which is clearly just a troll. You're not going to change their mind. They've got seven followers. Just ignore that. If it's a, an, uh, an institution of some kind, it's their official Twitter, and they are saying something or responding to something, that then is a... Or if it's, you know, a celebrity with a, plenty of followers or that kind of thing where actually there is influence there. Because I think that's the difference is there's a lot of Twitter yeah. that doesn't matter because they have no influence. They are a, they are a, uh, a symptom of what's going on because they are caught up in it it's almost to feel sorry for they've been taken in by this they're in the cult that's one level but then there's a level of influence that's either doesn't understand it or knows full well and is saying it and they're in a position of influence because of the institution they are or an mp or a celebrity or whatever and then that's a uh, that's then the public square i think the other stuff i don't think really is the public square in the same way that is trolling but the public square side of it that is the that needs challenging yeah, definitely, because, like, I know some people on Twitter have, like, a rule of not replying to trolls and things like that, and I block people pretty easily. I think the times when I will put effort into sticking around for an argument is if the account has a blue tick on it. Yeah. Um, and I found recently there aren't really any blue ticks coming for me anymore because I blocked them all. Yeah. I yeah. blocked them. I argue with them and then I block them. Go, well, that argument was interesting. See you later. Yeah. I've uh, I've said about this before. I use the, the blockchain extension on oh, do you? Chrome. So if I get, I've done it. I started doing it when. I'm not disapproving. I just, I was just like, oh, oh I'm so, I'm too lazy for that. Or I've done it when, there's only been twice that I've put my account on private. And that's when I just had the speed at which I was having, and obviously this is nowhere near what other people, particularly women, are getting. So I've only had it twice where it's been like this, where I've had to just lock my account because just to stop the notifications coming from a pile on of trolls. So that's when it's clearly when, or it, I can spot when someone with a reasonable number of followers has quote tweeted me or said something mentioning yeah. me, that then all their crazies come after me so i will go in and just block all their followers so if i get in if i've I done that with, um i've clicked on the one that the one that quote tweets me and i'll click on everybody who liked it and everybody yeah. who quote tweeted that and yeah. everybody who liked all the comments in it and yeah. i'll block them all yeah. but that's only if i can be bothered yeah and the yeah, only reason i do that is not because i'm worried that they're going to come after me or chat shit to me but i do it because these are mostly losers sitting at home that have got too much time on their hands and they're reporting everything you post. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I am I was quite pleased to be on the 4,000 list. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was on that as well. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought I wasn't going to be on it. I was like, there's no way I'll be on that. And then I looked at it and I was like, yes, I'm on it. <laughs> and then I thought, hang on a minute, this isn't good. And then there were loads of people posted about how disappointed they were or how yeah. embarrassed they were that they're not on the list. Yeah. <laughs> turf harder um but the yeah i think that is you're right the the risk of being reported like i had my pin tweet reported this week and i had the notification come through about whatever german law that there's no problem with it and he's like that's been my t pin tweet for over a year or nearly a year and it's like if there was a problem with that it, i wouldn't have an account still i am yeah I'm, I'm pretty direct in what i tweet a lot of the time but i'm also careful enough i don't want to lose the account because it has Same. connected with so many people because of it Same. um so yeah i'm i'm kind of fine walking that line there i'm like that with my social media i know that um some of the people going after me have made groups on facebook and i think one of the groups had like a thousand members in it and they were literally just sharing links to everything i post and telling everyone to report me every day and i've still got all of my social media so fuck you yeah Cool. Well, we've been going for over an hour. I think that's a good note to, to, to end on there on the, the positives, hopefully, of social media. It's been so lovely chatting to you because I know we've yeah, chatted on, on DMs and stuff on Twitter. So it's what's been one of the really nice things about starting to do these videos is people I only ever have interacted with on Twitter. 
uh, I've, I've been actually able to have a chat with. So that's been really nice. Yeah, it's um, been lovely to meet you. So thanks for that. Thank you everyone for, for, for joining us and watching this. I'll put links to kind of everyone's Twitter and websites and stuff in the description. And uh, we'll be back with another conversation soon. So thanks. Bye.